Nathaniel Popper is a reporter for the New York Times and is the author of Digital Gold, one of the best books about Bitcoin I've ever read. He stopped into our office to talk a little bit about the new book and the mystery of Bitcoin's secret founder, Satoshi Nakamoto. This is the definitive book on Bitcoin. If I'm going to learn about Bitcoin, I'm going to read it in here. I certainly tried to uh, okay. make it that. It's the history of how this crazy thing came to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in the process of writing this and the process of reporting on, on Bitcoin and a lot of other things, I realized that the best way to understand something as complicated as this is to, to start with the people who are actually using it and look at what they're doing and why they're doing it. Okay, before we go too deep down the rabbit hole, and I know you can go very deep, oh. and this is going to be a hoot, so let's, get, so let's have, like a, we'll have some sections. This is the first section. If you know anything about Bitcoin, how do you explain it to people? How did you explain it to your agent when you first talked to him? And how did you explain it to the editors? The best explanation that I uh, came up with, really, I came to during the course of reporting this. I mean, I can't tell you how many metaphors I heard <laughs> in the course of writing this to try to explain Bitcoin, to try to make it more clear. And to me, the two metaphors that really make most sense of it, and the simplest is that it's email for money. Okay. It's, it's just as email allows you to send something to any, anyone anywhere in the world without needing to go through a single institution. Uh, Bitcoin the, and the Bitcoin network allows you to do that with money. Send it, all you need is their address and it will get there. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the simplest idea. The other uh, concept that I think is, is sometimes hard to grasp, but there is a sort of simple notion underneath it, is the idea of basically the distributed database, the, mm -hmm. the spreadsheet in the sky, okay. the spreadsheet in the cloud that keeps track of all the Bitcoins. And those are kind of the two parts of, of, of the Bitcoin system that are sometimes hard to understand. And then I think you come back to this notion of digital gold, you know, money, that a scarce commodity that has been digitized. So I guess, what is it about right now that allows something like a big spreadsheet in the sky to exist? I mean, it, for, for the vast majority of people, if you think about, if you think about the current uh, economic system, it's very complex, there's all sorts of players, all sorts of actors, all kinds of moving parts. But this seems like, as you say, just a big spreadsheet. What is it about the current, uh, current technology, current uh, political situation, economic situation that allows this to happen? Now, I think the most notable thing to understand about the timing of Bitcoin was that the software was released four months after Lehman Brothers mm -hmm. went down. And um, there, there had been a lot of experiments in the past with similar sorts of of ideas that had never really taken off. And so I think, you know, at the simplest level, the financial crisis, you can see it in the writing of Satoshi Nakamoto, the mm -hmm. creator of Bitcoin. Uh, and you can see it in the other early users of Bitcoin was that this experience of having watched this financial crisis, having watched what uh, the central bank did in response to the financial crisis, obviously the argument that the financial, that the, that the central federal reserve, the central bank, uh, was in some sense responsible for the financial crisis. All of this, I think, created an opening for an alternative. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think on the simplest level, that's a part of this. I think, uh, you know, one other element that's, that's run throughout Bitcoin's history is a sort of tech utopianism that I think is pretty widespread right now. I think also in part caused by the financial crisis, the sense that we don't really trust institutions, we don't trust people, but we do trust technology. Um, and that cuts both ways, but I think that there is a real element of that utopianism mm -hmm. that has run throughout the Bitcoin story. And you say you found Satoshi, right? He's in here? I found Satoshi. 378. 378? I, I actually, uh, um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I've been very careful in talking about this. I mean, when I, when sure. I set out to write this book, I made it clear to everybody that you know, the goal of this book is not the a... the founder of Bitcoin, the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto. He's the mysterious founder of Bitcoin who nobody knows who he is. People suspected he was some poor guy in, in California. And the general feeling was that he was Nick Shabo, right? That was, certainly as the year went on and I had these conversations, the, the most frequent candidate that people brought up is, as you said, Nick Shabo, who's... Um, been at this for two decades. Mm -hmm. He, before Bitcoin was ever around, he created this thing called Bitgold. 
Um, he's a guy I met in the course of reporting this. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't go out much, he doesn't appear much, and so there are a lot of things that point to him, that are consistent with him being uh, Satoshi. Uh, I, I think perhaps the most interesting thing I learned in, in, in uh, researching his background and the background of Bitcoin is that he was part of this group of people uh, that were trying to build something like Bitcoin for a long time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stories that have claimed to identify Satoshi have sort of started from this notion that it could be anybody, you mm -hmm. know, that it, it, this was, <laughs> this, was this, this sort of almost supernatural creation. And the reality is, when you look at the history of this, it was a lot of people doing a lot of work over a lot of years, and you had to know about all of that work because a lot of those pieces went into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of narrows down the pool of people who it could be um, because it, it has to be somebody who knew about Hashcash from 1998 and who knew about David Chaum's digital signatures and who knew about all these things that were really limited to a small group of people. But, um, you know, I, I think my ultimate conclusion on, on, on Sabo is that he certainly contributed to Bitcoin. He was part of this group mm -hmm. of people who, without whom Bitcoin wouldn't have been possible.